Ever since rumors began circulating about a Lego barrier door, Lord of the Rings fans have been eagerly awaiting the official word and then release of that set. Now that the set is here, we can go ahead and analyze some of the big questions that have emerged about it, such as whether or not it's worth $460, how big does it look next to Rivendell, or even the Tower of Orthanc from 2013, and is this a repetitive build that is, well, going to give you the pieces you would want for the price. In this video, I'm going to take an independent look at all of those questions and more to determine how good of a set this really is. There are three instruction manuals with the set, which is great for family or friends hoping to build this together. The first book tackles the base of the set, which requires you to burn through 19 of the set's 40 bags. The base relies mostly on regular studs on top building techniques, as the lava and rock foundation are very parts intensive. If you love building the first stage of a modular building, for instance, you'll appreciate the level of detail here as well. The base itself is very large, especially when you examine the finished product. Inside, there is a forge, dungeon, simple door opening function, a golem sized cave with a fish, and a secret spider compartment. Outside, there is an entry, buttresses, and lots and locks of rocks. Despite comprising nearly half of the build, this process was enjoyable. Icons and advanced LEGO sets these days contain a lot of angles, snot building techniques, and creative use of pieces. This section checks off these boxes. In particular, check out these buttresses, which highlight the attributes that I mentioned above, as they are creatively built and adhere to angled wall sections. The second instruction manual is the shortest and is used to inform the build of the second layer, which is the orc cafeteria. This build was interesting at times, repetitive at others, and ultimately rewarding. This is a relatively short section of the tower, but still has plenty of details, including the rack of utensils, full dining table, seats, a cauldron with a bone, and yes, even a carrot, a chalkboard with the declaration that meat is back on the menu, and another secret compartment, this one showing Sauron's plans for the Rings of Power. The repetitive components were the buttresses and angled wall sections, both of which were a bit tedious to build. That said, they are small and not all that time consuming to put together, and I admit I built this section last, so perhaps I was just eager to finish the set. One particular section of this build that I enjoyed was the asymmetry along the edges. On one side, you have an evil-looking spire that is very befitting of Barad-dûr. The other side has this rock formation continuing to work its way up along with another evil-looking spire. The third instruction manual is used to construct the remainder of the tower, which includes Sauron's throne room, the mouth of Sauron's library, and the Eye of Sauron. The interiors are solid, especially the mechanism that splits Sauron's throne from which a palantir emerges. The library has a sliding ladder, which is a fun detail, but is hardly necessary. The one drawback of this section was that you had to place numerous stickers on the inside of these large quarter round panels, which poses a bit of a problem if you were to make a mistake. However, the real treat of this section is building the eye. My eldest daughter built that and found it to be an original and engaging build. Upon its completion, my youngest daughter declared that it was the greatest thing ever built out of Lego. So kudos to the set designer, Antika Brokhanov, for nailing the most important part of this set. The exterior here it contains plenty of snot work, particularly since Antika wanted to differentiate the angles and the building techniques of each level. This part of the build is very reminiscent of the Saturn V rocket, which uses plenty of bow slopes to create the rounded shape of the exterior. However, there are numerous protrusions from the tower, including differently styled windows, various spikes, and these wing-like shapes. Despite the variation, there was quite a bit of repetition in the section, as you had to place over 60 bow slopes together, and these spikes right here that require you to build the same thing over and over again, such that my eldest daughter was relieved when she was done doing that. One last note, the top of the tower by the eye is removable, such that you can add more tower sections and make Barador even more imposing than the standard version, if you have the money, that is. So how would I rate this build? I would say it was overall pretty good and generally satisfying. That said, 
I would rate it below the build of two other sets that are a similar price range, one being Rivendell and the other one being the Lion Knight's Castle. I think both of those sets delivered more originality and differentiation between all of the different sections than this one. If you're into the whole price per piece metric of value, this set easily bests the 10 cents per piece threshold. But is this because there are a lot of tiny pieces? After all, Rivendell does the same and has lots and lots of one by one tiles for the roof. Well, here there are a bunch of small pieces, such as one by one plates and tiles, cheese slopes, and small modified plates like this tooth piece. However, there are plenty of substantive bricks, including 30 one by two dark brown bricks, nearly 150 dark blay bricks, and plenty of snot bricks. Oh, and then I mentioned there are over 400 black plates and modified plates of various sizes. In terms of interesting or new pieces, we get some 1x2 bricks with a stud on the side in black for the third time. There are also these brand new angled 2x4 slopes in black that I've never seen before and work fantastically for the buttresses of this set. The cool yellow mud guard is used in the eye for the third time in that color. Plus you get these 2x4 light blade jumper plates for just the second time and these 63 trans orange 1x4 tiles which are brand new. At the top of the tower, we also get some dual molded pieces around the eye. And of course, I want to give a special shout out to the Palantir, which is an incredible double-sided printed head. On one side is the White Tree of Gondor burning, and on the other is the Shire also burning. This is a great Easter egg for a couple moments in the movies where we see people look into the Palantir, and is a great detail to include in the set. All told, this is a very substantive build, and the price per piece ratio works out to about 8.4 cents per piece. So I think no matter how you slice it or dice it, there is some great value when it comes to the pieces included. One incredible aspect of Rivendell was the sheer number and quality of the minifigs included. Barador is a step back in that regard. Including Gollum, you get 10 minifigs, plus a skeleton, which strikes me as a bit low for a set of this size. That said, you do get some incredible minifigs here, including Gothmog, the Mouth of Sauron, and Sauron himself. The prints on their torsos across all of the minifigs are exquisite, and I particularly like the double-sided printing on most of the heads. Looking specifically at Gollum, this is an updated version from the old sets that came out over a decade ago. You can see here by the side-by-side -side photos that the face painting is a bit different, as is the overall shape and angle of the back. Personally, I prefer the old version slightly over this one, but it's not really a big issue to me because I think the new one is well done and would suffice for a full Lord of the Rings line should LEGO decide to go that route, and I really hope that they do. The Mouth of Sauron is very similar to the original one from over a decade ago, which happened to be my favorite minifig of all time. In this case, the difference is with the helmet, which does an even better job of framing his sinister snarl. The printing on the torso extends nicely to his legs, and I gotta say, overall, they did a fantastic job with this character. The Sauron minifig is also very well done, although I can understand why some fans wanted the use of taller legs. That said, I think the LEGO designers have done a good job with this as constructed, as the helmet and shoulder pads add height and make him feel imposing compared to other minifigs. I want to give a special shout out to the printing on this minifig, as it is incredible all the way down, and I want to highlight the red eyes that peek through the helmet, which adds some intimidation and a sense of evil with the character. The Frodo and Sam minifigs are retreads from Rivendell, minus the capes, which honestly is a bit disappointing, but at least you get the two main characters, regardless of whether you buy Rivendell or Barad-dûr. The last minifig I'm going to talk about is the Gothmog minifig, which I think is fantastic, great printing on the head, and even the torso, despite it being covered up by his armor. When this set was announced, you knew it was going to be big, but you don't appreciate just how big it is until you sit or stand next to it. As it's measured across from left to right, you've got 17 and a half inches across the base, and the set itself is close to 33 inches tall. 
The full realization of its size comes when you stack the layers on top of one another at the very end of the construction process. Its size is sufficiently imposing, and the black rock, spikes, and sinister spires add character to this monster of a set. As a display piece, there is no disguising its dominating presence. Here is a quick comparison between the two towers, along with a side-by-side -side of Barador and Rivendell. It's easy to see just how massive this set is, even when sitting next to other large Lord of the Rings sets. Of course, the big issue in terms of display is its height. It's not too tall for the source material, but it is quite tall to be on a typical display shelf. The solution in my mind is to store it on top of something, whether it be a table or an unenclosed shelf. But that risks the destruction of the set should a pet or child run into it and knock it over somehow. If you have a good solution for how to display this set next to some of your others, go ahead and comment down below. For the meantime, I plan on increasing the height of one of my display shelves, which will allow this to fit on it, but it will have downstream ramifications for the rest of my LEGO display. So now we come to the money question. Is this set worth $460? Well, I think if you take a look at just the sheer dominance as a display piece, or even the price per piece ratio, or even the subjective feelings that you get when you build this set and it's done, yes, I think that the collection of pieces and the look of the set is worth $460. But for many people, that really isn't the question at hand. It's, should I spend $460 on this, or could I spend it on something else? And that is where I run into a bit of an issue with this set. Rivendell comes with over 500 more pieces to the set, along with nearly a dozen more minifigs for just $40 more. Now I get that Rivendell also has a lot of one by one tiles to place on the roof, which cheapens the price per piece ratio. Still, that set is an incredible build, and I think it's a build that's better than this one. I would also say that the color differentiation and the overall appeal of the set strikes me as being better for Rivendell than this one. And I say that understanding and appreciating that LEGO didn't just make this one huge black mass. I would also note that another set in the same price range, the Lion Knight's Castle, is probably a better set than this if you aren't a huge Lord of the Rings fan. So if you love Bear Door and the concept of Lord of the Rings, then by all means, get this set especially if you already have Rivendell. But given the choice between this or Rivendell, I'm taking Rivendell. A second issue that emerges with the release of this set is how many Lord of the Rings fans cannot afford to buy Barador or Rivendell and want minifig-related sets for Lord of the Rings. In other words, not Brickheads. And I'm really hoping that LEGO sees that Rivendell did well, that this set is going to do really well, such that they look into creating a new line of Lord of the Rings sets. Perhaps that will happen later this year with the release of the new animated film, The War of the Rohirrim, or even in 2025, 2026, when there's allegedly going to be a new movie about the journey of Gollum. Now, LEGO fans, I think, understandably, want to have minifig-based sets that are affordable for this theme. It is a beloved theme. In fact, when we were in line waiting to get the set, we were... Uh, amidst a lot of LEGO fans. In fact, this lineup before the opening of the LEGO store at, in our local mall was almost as long as it was for January 1st. And I estimate roughly half of the people present wanted to get this set. And I have no problem with LEGO creating big ticket Lord of the Rings sets like this or Rivendell. But I hope that they are getting more information and data that warrants them creating more sets for fans that might be able to afford different price points, especially those at the lower end of the spectrum. So what would I rate this set overall? Well, out of 10, I'm giving it a nine. To me, this is a fantastic set that is clearly worth the $460 in terms of the price per piece, the display value, and then just the subjective view of the set when it's all done and as you are building it. It definitely kept me engaged for much of the process and was a lot of fun to build with my wife and two kids. While I think there are some critiques of the set, namely the lack of minifigs overall and some of the retreaded minifigs with Frodo and Sam, I do think that this is worth getting if you have the money and or you have 
Rivendell already. That said, I would not put it as high as I would other sets that are similarly priced, specifically Rivendell or the Lion Knight's Castle. The reason being that I think those sets do a better job with some advanced building techniques, keeping you engaged throughout the entire process, and honestly, applying a lot of stickers to the backside of curved elements was a bit of a problem for us. So there you have it, our independent review of Barador. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If you did, go ahead, like this video, and subscribe so that we don't miss out any more of our Lord of the Rings content. Thanks for watching, and always remember to keep building together.